Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us this summer afternoon in what will be, I think, a wonderful conversation with Jin Donghua and Pat Trish Moser of uh, Columbia SIPA. I'm Merit Jane O'Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs. I wanna thank Susan Storms, our head of alumni affairs for organizing this occasion. And I know that we are joined uh, with a remarkable group of SIPA and Columbia alumni, students, faculty, and friends. So thank you all so much uh, for being uh, with us today. So let me start uh, by introducing our speakers, and then we're going to have a pretty informal uh, conversation amongst us, and then open it up for questions uh, from you. And it is being uh, recorded, uh, so we will, uh, I think, uh, share this conversation afterwards, unless uh, there are any concerns about that. The questions can be submitted through the Q&A function, and you're welcome to start sending them in uh, when, uh, whenever you wish, and then we'll turn to those and, uh, and, uh, and get your questions before our experts. So let me start with introducing uh, Jin Donghua, who is Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank. But if you've looked at his resume, you will also see that he has an extraordinary bank background uh, that spans not only uh, leadership and finance positions at the World Bank, where he is now treasurer and vice president, but he was also at the IFC earlier in his career at the Asian Development Bank, also at the UNDP and the African Development Bank. So he has a a very comprehensive view of multilateral uh, institutions. And at the World Bank, he's responsible for the capital markets operations and oversees an annual funding program of 60 to $70 billion through debt issuance of the IBRD and IDA. He leads a very sophisticated global team of capital markets professionals that not only manage uh, their own debt portfolios, um, uh, but also a, a very large asset portfolio for the World Bank Group and um, many clients. He's also the uh, pension finance administrator of the World Bank. He can tell you more about that. Uh, and was previously vice president and treasurer of the IFC where he really established global treasury, a global treasury uh, market and focused on the development of local currency debt capital markets and a host of very innovative uh, financial products and, uh, and solutions. Uh, so really a fantastic foundation uh, for coming uh, to the bank. And I know there were products that were issued in Rwanda, Nigeria, Indonesia, Colombia, Uzbekistan, India, and doubtless uh, many, many others. And he enhanced, I, I, I know, IFC's loan syndication and co-investment uh, programs. So there's much more that could be said. I think we can't leave this introduction without mentioning that uh, we're very proud of him as having a master's in public administration from Columbia SIPA, as well as an MBA and an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. So if you don't mind, I'll refer Jin Dong, thank you so much for being with us. We're proud of you and honored to have you with us uh, today. Also with us is uh, Dr. Patricia Trish Moser, who directs our MPA in advanced, it's a, called a program in policy management. It's really one of our most demanding master's programs in, in, in economic policy management. And also an initiative we started several years ago that's looking, focusing on central banks and financial policy, which we've taught for decades about, about economics and finance and capital markets but you know, more and more, the role of central banks is really very uh, crucial. And um, uh, Trish spent over 20 years at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as a senior manager in the open markets desk in the research department. She also went after the financial crisis to the treasury department in the office of financial research 
I think standing up those early efforts at understanding capital market flows following the financial crisis. Uh, she's worked with the Bank of England and was a member of the Deputies Committee of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, a PhD economist from MIT, and a professor uh, at SEPA teaching around capital markets. So great to have you with us, uh, Trish, uh, today. So two experts, and the title of our talk is Advancing the Sustainable Development Goals, How the World Bank Works with Its Members in a Post-COVID World. So if I may, I'd, I'd like to invite Jindong to start us off by helping us understand how you see the post-COVID world. We're still in COVID, but in this moment, um, and the areas that you think uh, have been you know, most affected by the crisis uh, that have really set back or in some areas maybe advanced the SDGs? Well, Dean Channel, thank you so much for, for inviting me and, and Professor Mosser, it's always a delight to, uh, you know, to be on the same panel with you. And let me give a shout out to, uh, to uh, a SEPA community who joined uh, the session. Hopefully we can have an have a interesting conversation uh, so let me be very, very uh, brief uh, in my introduction. I have worked in international development for, for the past three decades. And, uh, you know, since World War II, we have been making progress steadily. And there has been, always been ups and downs. But, you know, this pandemic really has been the most regressive period uh, in terms of, um, you know, international development agenda, right? Uh, we have seen up to 150 million people going back to poverty, and that has not happened in the past 30 years. Uh, we see, uh, you know, 1.6 billion children out of school. Uh, and, and unlike in OECD countries where you can still do virtually, many kids just, uh, you know, dropped out, right? Uh, when you look at entrepreneurship, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, 33% of those working in a country, a developing country, uh, uh, um, are out, out of work. Uh, so a lot of businesses were devastated and many of them are women owned uh, enterprises. So, so uh, and not to mention that poor countries already facing high debt levels and they just don't have the financial resources to cope with the additional demand. So inequality is, is something that is, that is also very prominent. Uh, and of course, we have the perennial ongoing climate change challenges, many natural disasters, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So it is in this period that I feel very proud that I work for the World Bank uh, and, and I feel the unique value we as a multilateral development institution that brings to, 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 to the table. And I have to be very humble to say that, you know, this little virus teaches us there is no national border. Uh, and we need global solutions for global challenges. And multilateralism is really the way to go. So while the Federal Reserve, US Treasury, you know, European Central Bank, European government have really been very, you know, nimble in, in, in coming up with stimulus program in, all sorts of ways in, in helping their own citizens who are helping the, the, the people uh, in over 100 countries. Uh, and this is where we step in the World Bank. So the World Bank is by far the largest source of, of, of uh, development finance in this period. So between last April and now, we have now committed over $127 billion, really by far the largest source of financing. And we have set aside $12 billion uh, for vaccines for the most needed countries uh, and many other things going on. So uh, let me just say that uh, this is not the, the first crisis, not, not the last crisis. What we do in the World Bank is that we learn uh, and, and we, we, we reflect on how this crisis yet again changed how we think about development, right? And therefore, you know, post COVID period, we wanted to define development into what we call word grit, right? How do we then do development 
that is green, inclusive, and sustainable, right? And, and, and therefore, sustainability will stay as an important, uh, uh, you know, anchor to, 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 to the future of the world. So, so let me just stop there. And there are many more things I'd like to, to put on the table with, with uh, if time permitting. But uh, certainly, I, uh, I, I, I happy to and look forward to a very in interactive uh, discussion. Back to you, Dean Jeno. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I think that's a great introduction. And um, um, uh, can I just ask one factual question? When you mention 127 billion, how much of that has already been deployed uh, uh, at this point? It's a big, it's a good number, uh, but uh, I mean, it's still, it, this is going to be phased in gradually. I, these are not interventions that have all been deployed at this point, but these are commitments uh, going forward, is, is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. So, 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 so let me explain that um, it's one thing to commit, it's another, uh, what we call countries uh, absorbing capability, right? It's not that you transmit the money to the central bank and central bank can the next day, because you have to make sure you have proper institutional capacity, uh, disclosure standard, anti-corruption measures, a lot of different things. But with that commitment, countries can begin working on this. A, a big portion of it is already dispersed. I think in the last year, uh, you know, I mean, this is not official number, but I have to double check. At least uh, out of the 127 uh, billion, in terms of disbursement every year between IBRD and IDA is about $50 billion. Right, uh -huh. and I'm sure we stepped up already. So, so um, uh, let me. Since you mentioned that too, uh, there is another question. You know, you 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 committed twelve billion dollars for vaccine. Why only three billion has been, you know, used in purchasing vaccine? Again, it is not a question of, you know, get the money there. There is just not enough vaccine to go around. Yes. Right. Take Tokyo or, or Japan, for example. Japan is a country that is willing, ready, and capable. And yet only about 5% of their population has received full vaccination. It's because there is not enough to go around, right? So, so when, you, when people read news reports, uh, I, I think there is, there is much more nuanced reason behind as a story, I'm, I'm glad I have an opportunity to explain a little bit. Yeah, thank you. That's why I asked, because when you hear these numbers and they're impressive and they sound like the world's come together, you know, it's still very hard to deploy it and deploy it effectively on the problems that you've identified. And so that's a helpful framing. Now, I know Trish Moser is a macroeconomist, so she probably looks at this period you know, from a macro lens. And, and I wonder if you could share with us your sense of, you know, what the impact of COVID has been. Because, you know, as I know, uh, Jin Dong and the bank have been so clear in saying, you know, this has had uneven effects around the world uh, uh, and it's gonna have uneven recovery. And, and some of the consequences for the poorest countries can be very severe. And I know you've spoken a bit about that. Could you share your perspective? And, 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 in, and indeed, if you have a comment on what the developed economies have to offer, that would be useful too. I'd be happy to. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's always such a great pleasure to, to speak on a panel with Jing Dong. Um, so uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm going to, echo at the beginning what Jing Dong said, from, from a global growth perspective, COVID has been just a disaster and a huge setback for sustainable development goals. Uh, frankly, a number of the key sustainable development goals were already behind schedule at the beginning of 2020, and sadly, they're further behind now. And in developing economies, for the reasons that you cite, the odds are they may slip a little further back uh, even so. Um, really importantly, the countries, the sectors, the segments of society within particular countries that could be the biggest beneficiaries of SDGs are also the ones with the biggest economic setbacks. 
um, food insecurity in the United States has skyrocketed, let alone in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, and unfortunately, those same countries, sectors, and segments of the society are those with the fewest internal resources, either public sector resources or private sector resources to actually deal with the pandemic. And bluntly, what little time, attention, institutional heft, fiscal space that they actually have has basically been diverted away from forward progress and is focused almost completely on trying to hold their societies and their economies together. The political turmoil that's gone along with this is, is, um, has only made this problem worse, unfortunately. Um, let, regarding advanced economies, um, COVID has also been a setback because the wealthiest nations who should be and, and are um, the drivers of aid, of investment, of financing for sustainable development have also taken huge hits. Um, and their first priority, at least for the last year, um, is and has to be their own citizenry and their economies. And they have massively increased their debt levels and their borrowings to do it. Um, last but not least, I think um, uh, the inequality across the world with respect to the impact of COVID is going to linger. Um, the advanced economies, the minute there is enough vaccine, are going to bounce back. The United States already is quite strongly, and most of the rest of them will follow. But the lack of public health resources and the negative sort of uh, economic impacts of COVID are going to linger much longer. All you have to do is look at the IMF growth forecasts for the different segments to know that the advanced economies bounce right for the next, this is a growth forecast for the next few years. The advanced economies are going to bounce back quite rapidly. The emerging market economies are going to bounce back pretty rapidly, and it is years before the low-income countries' growth gets back on target. Um, I'm hard, sorry to be such a downer here because I actually think there there is some good news in all of this, but I think the macro setback is really significant, and um, it's sort of worth laying out pretty carefully that this is a big challenge for the whole globe. So, you know, we're at this kind of interesting, difficult time also uh, uh, around multilateralism, even before the pandemic. And you would think that with this pandemic, it, it uh, on the one hand, it's shown how interconnected the world is. But on the other hand, it's increased uh, a lot of um, incentives for countries uh, to look <laughs> inward, to be focused on resilience in ways that is exclusionary. Uh, et cetera. And so there are a lot of risks in the system uh, around um, collective action and expanding uh, multilateralism. And I'm wondering though, I mean, it could have been worse. I mean, in fact, I think you, you saw a lot of protectionism that didn't come to pass or that was very transitory. But I'm wondering, Jin Dong, if you have a sense of uh, the sort of scope for multilateralism and the areas where it kind of is revealing itself most effectively and where you wish it might be greater? Well, uh, uh, Dean, uh, while I agree on the tremendous challenge of the economic outlook, especially for developing countries, um, I, I actually a little bit more optimistic on, on the future of multilateralism because I, I work and live in multilateralism every day. You know, the speed with which where the World Bank Board, which represents the entire world, we have 189 or 190 member countries, um, the speed with which our board uh, came up with this uh, 160 billion package, you know, in 18 months to provide help for, for countries in need uh, was very impressive, right? Now, our shareholders cover the entire um, social economic uh, spectrum and ideological spectrum. And yet, as a board, uh, you know, they reach consensus so fast. I think it was two weeks, within two weeks uh, in last March, that the board uh, supported a very strong program for the bank to pay, play a leading role. So that gives me hope. We also have seen uh, that, uh, uh, that the G20 has played a very useful role 
in representing a, a, a big consensus, for example, on debt uh, uh, sustainability, right? So through the work of the World Bank, where I think our president called on uh, the, the G20 to consider uh, the DSSI, which is uh, you know, a debt service suspension initiative, because the argument is very strong that those countries who are already indebted, if you prioritize you know, uh, paying debt versus additional resources to the country, the urgency is to suspend those debt payments for the time being, right? So quickly that was taken over by G20 and G20 represents both OECD countries, developing countries too, for them to reach a consensus in supporting and themselves agreeing to a, a suspension of bilateral debt, official debt, is a remarkable multilateral approach. So through which I think, you know, what, what we understood, uh, uh, um, you know, between May 1st, 2020, when the DSSI was, uh, was um, agreed, uh, uh, to now, uh, we have, you know, saying over $5 billion relief for some of the poorest countries, right? And that would be additional financial resources. So I just wanted to use that example to showcase multilateralism uh, is in the works in spite of different headlines. The second I wanted to mention is on vaccines. I think on vaccines, uh, you know, together with, uh, with the IMF and of course WHO, WTO, and other UN organization, for example, UNICEF, Gavi, through the COVAX, we have been the loudest voice in highlighting the benefit of equitable distribution vaccine, not only on humanitarian or social reasons, but also for economic reasons, right? Because as the sooner you know, humanity achieves herd immunity, not only just one country, but more broadly, there is a faster economic recovery there. And I think I'm glad actually as a G7, uh, the G7 country made commitment in terms of um, uh, whether it's donating or, or, or make vaccines available uh, to developing countries. Certainly that is another role multilateral institutions played in highlighting the need for equitable distribution vaccine. So on that, on vaccine, I think I wanted to use these two examples to show multilateralism is alive and well. And I think in a post COVID world, when we address come back to SDG goals, you know, many of the things, healthcare in other than COVID-19, right? For women, for children, nutrition, uh, logistics, global trade, uh, uh, again, the voice of multilateralism, which is often the voice of reason, I think will play a central role in a global agenda, uh, uh, you know, post COVID-19. Let me just stop. Well, thank you. Uh, maybe I could use that as a point of departure um, to, to sort of think about the, uh, I mean, one of the one of the big transformations that's been accelerated by COVID nineteen is the digital transformations uh, uh, around the world, and 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 I think it's accelerated particularly around finance. And and one of the things you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Jin Dong, was about financial inclusion, and that's that's a role where you know the bank has a role to play, uh, but it so do private sector entities and. You know, one might imagine that when the bank can work with capital markets and with the private sector is when you can see some powerful momentum around areas like uh, uh, financial inclusion. Um, uh, so you have to work, get all the parties together, uh, you know, local governments, private sector and multilateral sometimes can make interventions that matter. How do you think about that? opportunity of the bank in collaboration, uh, you know, with capital markets for financial inclusion? Yeah, no, this is a, this is a topic dear to my heart. Um, but let me uh, first mention the digital transformation first. Certainly, COVID-19 has uh, uh, really showcased the, the, the inequality, right? Because as I said, kids in OECD country can continue uh, their schooling uh, some may have preferred it uh, because they play video games on the side. 
uh, little kids, but many kids in developing countries, especially girls, when they drop off school, they don't come back. How do we make sure that there is a digital uh, infrastructure that will provide education opportunity should you know, future lockdowns happen? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a critical issue. Um, but in the broader issue of using digital technology to enable financial inclusion, we already have successful examples, right? For example, Kenya. Before M-Pesa was introduced, uh, uh, access to finance for Kenya adults was less than 10%. Now it's over 90%. And actually, Kenyan Treasury issued the first savings bond where Kenyan citizens can buy through their cell phone. Actually, this is ahead of the US, ahead of China, ahead of many other countries that, that have better digital infrastructure. It doesn't really have to be cutting edge, high, high tech, but technology could help in accelerating uh, 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 transformation. But last, the, the most important thing is capital market because global savings are in the magnitudes of hundreds of trillions. Uh, so there is enough global savings that could, could solve the world's problem, right? When we say that you need $1 trillion investment every year uh, to solve climate change, you need another trillion for infrastructure. Actually, there is enough saving to do that. They are not, they're, they're just not going to the right places. They just slush around in OECD countries. So the role we play as a World Bank is exactly uh, uh, connecting and risk transforming global savings uh, into development finance resources. So let me, let me actually spend a lot of time because this is probably not well understood. The World Bank actually has two financial institutions. One is called the IBRD. This is the oldest World Bank institution set up in 1945. And the other is IDA, which you know, supports the poorest countries. Let's take IBRD, for example, right? IBRD is a bank. It's rated by credit rating agencies. It is AAA rated so that we have a capital base, right? The equity of shareholders in the bank. Over the past 75 years, our shareholders has seeded the bank with about less than $20 billion paid in what we call paid in capital, right? Representing the shareholders' interest in the bank. Guess what? Using that 20 billion paid in capital and some callable capital, which we never called, the World Bank Treasury has issued over a trillion dollar of bonds, a trillion dollar, okay? Of which about 80% became over 800 billion was direct development finance projects in developing countries. What we have done is leveraging the power of capital market using a small capital base given by our shareholders, tapped the vast savings pool and made a huge difference. So that is the power of capital market, right? So, so I think uh, this is the role, uh, uh, you know, along the way we have done a lot of financial innovation. I hope I have time to, to highlight some of those because this also has huge potential in yet again, upscaling the number of financing. But let me also say that the, because we are constrained by the size of the bank, the size of the capital paid in, Ultimately, it is not the World Bank's money that will make all the problems of the world go away. It has to be the private sector, institution investor, right? Our role is to make conditions ready in developing country so that private sector feel comfortable and they feel that the, the, there is a proper return and uh, risk profile. But we'll come to ESG and, and, and discuss how through ESG, we could actually uh, uh, scale up and, and incentivize uh, uh, institution investors to come in. But again, as a treasurer of the World Bank, capital market plays just a pivotal role in connecting global savings and then turn that into development finance uh, uh, resources. Thank you very much. May I invite Trish to comment on this overall theme of, of, yeah. uh, of sustainable sustainability financing and in, in, a, in a COVID and post-COVID world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so first of all, I do want to make one comment quickly about uh, the digitalization 
acceleration uh, that COVID has caused. And uh, I agree completely with, with what Jing Dong said about, about uh, financial inclusion. Um, uh, and it doesn't always have to be incredibly high tech, but it's not just financial inclusion. Um, greater use of digital technologies across the economy, but particularly in finance, improve efficiency. They improve productivity. They lower barriers to entry, particularly for new and small businesses. They lower the cost of doing business. So in addition to the inclusion, there are potentially enormous benefits to uh, doing this acro across societies, but most particularly, um, I think in low income countries um, and emerging market economies. Um, uh, the question is in a few cases, those are gonna require some infrastructure investments, but it seems to me to be one of the distinct upsides where I will agree completely with Jing Dong of COVID that we have sort of have evidence right in front of our eyes about how well this can work and what the benefits can be. Um, and it would be a real missed opportunity, I think, not to take advantage of that to the extent possible, both within countries, but I think particularly in development finance. So that's about the digital <laughs> uh, revolution side. Um, um, on the capital markets role, um, first of all, let me say that, um, that the efforts by the World Bank and by Jing Dong in his previous role at the IFC to leverage their balance sheet to bring in private sector capital behind the AAA rating of those institutions to improve development finance is an incredible achievement and our hats should go off to them because they really are expanding the capacity to do this. Um, I do wanna mention a couple of risks though. I seem to be the downside person today. I don't know why, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but let, me, let me mention a couple of risks in the current environment that I think are worth mentioning. Um, uh, the first one is a very old concept called crowding out. Uh, the debt levels, uh, particularly government debt levels, but also private sector debt levels, the advanced economies, the large emerging market economies, I mean, deficits to GDP went up 400% in the advanced economies. They went up more than 100% in emerging market economies. Low income economies, unfortunately, they only run about 40%, which is one of the reasons that they're struggling. Um, but those, those debt levels are huge, really, really huge, particularly for the largest advanced economies and the sheer mountain of debt that's out there. Um, the big companies around the world have levered up even more in the last couple of years. And there is a risk, it seems to me, um, that at some point in the search for safe assets all around the world, um, that there is a danger that some of what is truthfully going to be, could be incredibly productive development finance could get crowded out or at least made more expensive simply because there is so much supply um, going on out there. Um, uh, the, the, unfortunately, and here's the second risk, I'm particularly concerned about that if global interest rates go up significantly. And kind of by design, the advanced economies have set their monetary policies in a way that they want global interest rates to go up. They want inflation to go up, not too much, but they want it to go up because it's been frankly too low for too long. But, it, but managing long-term <laughs> rates and inflation rates is tricky business for central banks. Um, and the problem is, of course, as we all know, that when the United States and the other advanced economies, you know, get the sniffles, the rest of the world uh, gets the flu, uh, and that can tend to happen with higher inflation and higher interest rates. And so, I, I'm I'm curious to hear from Jing Dong if if he thinks I'm crazy and I'm worrying about something that shouldn't be worried about, or whether he sees this as a risk as well. Thank you very much, because actually, you know, we, we talk a lot about the World Bank and multilateral institutions as kind of crowding in development finance. Uh, um, and uh, you're emphasizing that uh, given the current debt levels, there's a kind of crowding out problem. So, yeah, Jin Dong. Potentially, potentially. <laughs> yeah, so, no, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is my concern also. Um, let's take a typical, um, uh, well, no country is typical. Let's, let's take Kenya, since I mentioned Kenya, right? 
So before the uh, before the COVID nineteen, and because of the quantitative easing uh, since global financial crisis, uh, yield in uh, fixed income in, uh, instruments in OECD countries were very low. Now many developing countries took advantage. Uh, countries like Ghana, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, they went to international market. They borrowed mar- money directly, okay? But still, even at that level, it probably is at, compared to a loan lent by the World Bank, which we, we, charge, we charge a small charge that can keep the bank going. There is no profit there. But we are triple A, therefore our borrowing cost is very low, right? So compare a direct borrowing from Kenya, from capital market, to a borrowing from the World Bank. The difference is another 2%, 3%, 4%, okay? We're talking about a huge margin of additional uh, additional cost to the government. But of course, the government would like to diversify. Long-term, they'd like to establish themselves as a credible borrower in international capital market, like many East Asian countries have done. Philippines, Indonesia, uh, um, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, they have in- incredible sophistication in tapping into capital market savings uh, to, to aid their, uh, their national development plan. So long-term countries want to do this. What COVID has done, and uh, even more importantly, what inflation will do is to significantly uh, uh, increase the debt cost to countries who are already not affording, right? So I could imagine a situation where when US government borrowing cost goes back to, let's say 30 year bond, uh, goes back to 5%, I would imagine Kenya would have to borrow at double digit, right? Uh, For a country, for many African countries who is already highly indebted, what would that do to their national physical uh, uh, space? But paradoxically, that is exactly why they need the World Bank, they need the IMF to think ahead of the time in terms of how we can address this now so that we can stay target on target for all the SDGs, all the uh, uh, development goals all the social responsibilities of the government to their citizens without going into uh, uh, you know, a, a, a yet another debt crisis. It's very complex, I'm not an economist, but, but just simple fact of the inflationary trend worries me about the additional burden. Think of US treasury already becoming unsustainable on its own because of the you know, debt service becoming a much bigger part of the US government budget. If you think that's a challenge, it's even more challenging for many developing countries. So how do we make sure that the resources of multilateral development institutions uh, uh, could be there, ready to step in while country lose access to international capital market? That is a big, big topic in addition to many other challenges, climate change and all the SDG goals. So I'm glad we have a chance, you know, to at least sound this out. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, We will open it up for questions in about a few minutes. So please have them keep coming in. But before we do, let's talk a few minutes about ESG directly. It's a major wave around the world. The World Bank is also, uh, you know, thinking and contributing to thinking around uh, uh, ESG. Uh, maybe you could first tell us. I mean, it, for some asset managers, it, it it's an asset class. For others, it's a way of thinking about the investment process. There are new metrics being developed, and of course, environment. Uh, governance and you know human capital; these are all parts of it, and they can be seen as aligned quite well with the SDGs in 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 some ways. But there's a proliferation of metrics and approaches, um, and and I'm just wondering first if you could help us think about how does the World Bank think about ESG. And then from your perspective as treasurer, how are you deploying uh, uh, you know, actions around it? Dean Jeno, I could spend eight hours on this one, <laughs> but, but I'll try to be, to be very brief. 
let me borrow uh, 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 my good friend Hiro Mizuno, who is a former head of uh, head of uh, uh, investment for Jap uh, Japan's government uh, pension fund. Uh, he manages 1.6 trillion dollars. He realizes that um, that there is no alpha that could be made um, uh, for such a big pension fund, right? You really have to rely on the beta. Beta, which is a general trend of well-being of society, economy, so on and so forth. Because when you are a small investor, you have $100,000, $200,000, you could take a view on the market. Either you lose your shirt or you, know, you can get a pretty big return. But at a very macro level, when you look at the global assets in, uh, in its entirety, there is no alpha. The only alpha or outperformance is when our planet can progress and society you know, can do well, right? So thinking from that way, ESG has to be a issue that preoccupies all investors, right? Especially for pension fund, for long-term investors. So, so I would say ESG, uh, I, I'm glad in the last 10 years, we have seen such rapid progress in global thinking. Because why I say 10 years? Because it was 11 years ago when the World Bank issued the world's first green bond. It was a small bond, a couple of hundred sw uh, million Swedish krona, because there was some naughty investor at that time said, we have only one planet. Climate change will destroy us, and therefore we need to do something. And the World Bank had similar uh, uh, you know, goals, and therefore we issued the first green bond. At that time, who could have thought the green bond could be a $1 trillion market, right? So that certainly was the early thinking about socially responsible investing. And you know, eventually metamorphosing into the broader ESG factors. So I certainly think that going forward, each and every investment must consider its, its impact, right? Not only financial, but others. But, but there is often this recognition or this view that one is pitted against the other. That is, can you do well and do good at the same time? And I think as a World Bank, we actually say yes, because we have been doing that for 75 years, right? That is, we invest in developing countries, we, we, we make progress, not always a linear progression, but at least in a macro view, we have seen poverty being reduced. We have seen East Asian countries really have taken off. And those experiences are being repeated in other regions in the world. Meanwhile, we know we are, you know, we are committed to the highest standard when it comes to social, environmental, governance, anti-corruption, so on and so forth, right? We are a prime example. And of course, our AAA rated bonds um, uh, are bought by the most conservative investors. But when we go out to tell them that we issued a bond, $8 billion at the you know, height of the COVID-19 last May, we had a tremendous overflow of order book because those investors also feel while investing in the World Bank bond, making a rational economic return, but also achieving other you know, positive social goals, right? So we are sort of at the front row seat saying that they go together doing well and doing good. How could we you know, then socialize it in the broader sectors? Actually, we have private sector institution investors from PIMCO, BlackRock, uh, who are already doing a lot, right? But there is no global standard yet. And, and we are, as you said, the different matrix uh, developed, but we are doing our part. For example, the World Bank Treasury, in addition to our own green bond, SDG bond, we help a lot of developing governments in coming up with their green bond taxonomy and standard, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Mauritius or, or, or Malaysia, so that we can move to a higher standard. The so World Bank is the first international entity that issues what we call impact report, linking 
what we do in capital market to the impact or the or, or you know how much carbon dioxide that has been saved, what improvement we have made in women's uh, health, in nutrition, so on and so forth, right? So it's a continuous effort in improving global standard, and it's a it's a journey we are very excited to to play on. Now I am also head of World Bank Pension where we have about $37 billion under management, which is a US qualified pension. So through that lens, we are making progress in terms of, um, you know, we actually analyze through proxy voting, is your board, uh, you know, a company, investing company, is your board a board that, that has broad representation? It is, is it, um, you know, bring diversity inclusion in your board? And, and what's your environmental criteria when you select an investing company, you know, to our GPs. So we are incorporating many of the ESG factors into our own pension fund. And we have seen tremendous progress in, in, uh, in mainstreaming and incorporating ESG. The last thing I wanted to mention is that unless we turn those ESG factors into concrete financial differentiators, right? Um, you know, or, or if we were able to do that, I'm, I think we're going to see a tremendous uh, upscaling of investment into uh, good financial return, but positive social progress. So I'll give you one example. Let's say two U.S. companies, exactly the same profit margin, you know, uh, 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 price per share, so on and so forth. But, but if somehow its profitability could be discounted by how much carbon dioxide the company emits, if one is twice as much as the other, if somehow this can be monetized into the profitability, you could see behaviors of investors change fundamentally, right? So I, I, I'm glad, you know, things are happening. There are intellectuals, academia, including CIPA school, working on different matrices to make progress on this. I'm very excited. I think the future of ESG uh, 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 guiding industry to do well and do good, I think uh, that journey uh, has begun. And I think we will, we will make rapid progress. Sorry, I went a little bit long, but uh, Dean, no, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a vast question and also one that uh, what you're doing is very important. And I, I thank you for recognizing that SIPA is, uh, you know, is a leader in finance and economic uh, analysis and development also looks at these intersections uh, and is doing quite a bit of new analytical work around, you know, climate and finance, for example, around uh uh, and looking at it very holistically. And of course, you know, central banks are playing a role too and uh, around climate finance. If you told me that 10 years ago, I would have said, no, that's going to be very late in the, in, in the conversation, but it came on quite fast. I'm sure Trish has perspective around both uh, any number of these features. I invite you to offer your thoughts. Sure, sure, thank you. I have, um, I see there are lots of questions, so I'm going to be super brief. Um, first of all, yes. Um, and what I really applaud about the way that Jing Dong talked about this is the fact that um, standardization and metrics that actually tie the financial end to what's actually going on in the company and sort of standardizing that seems to me to be absolutely key for the future. There, the met metrics are being developed. They have not been sort of standardized as yet. And I'll be blunt, if you turn around and look at this from an investor standpoint and they're trying to figure out apples versus oranges and they're not quite sure one green bond from another, for example, it would be incredibly helpful if you really, really want sort of broad, really broad take up to come up with a set of standardizations and metrics. I, I think the combination of multilateral institutions like the World Bank, Central banks are very interested in this for certain. Um, the industry is interested, parts of the industry are, are quite interested in doing this too. I think particularly the large asset managers. And then of course, at some point, the financial regulators, because the end they're the ones that are gonna set the rules um, uh, for disclosure and, um, and standards. That combination 
could, I think, do this pretty rapidly. If um, we have a, the market has grown so fast that I don't think that over the course of the last 10 years that I don't think that um, uh, it's quite there yet. But if I had to put out a sort of policy institutional market structure priority, um, I would say that seems a pretty big one because we're not going to get where we want to go in terms of size and investments, I think, until we get a bit more standardization. That's my I, that's my prediction in any event. So I think it's something that should be done sooner rather than later. Well, let me turn to some of these questions. Uh, you have a comment on that point? Uh, it, it, please. Ian, I, I, uh, before you start a question, let me say as a proud CEPA graduate, I would not be able to articulate any of this if I had not gone to CEPA school almost 20 years ago. So just want to plug in. I'm sure I'm pitching to a converted group of CEPA community, but uh, Dean, uh, I want to uh, thank you and CEPA school uh, before we start the Q&A. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, I have seen you take your passion for this kind of institutional development, capital market development to each of these bodies that you've been affiliated with and make a huge difference. So thank you for all that you're doing and for keeping us uh, part of your, uh, your own journey. And I, 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 questions have come in from many different perspectives, but let's start with the subject we've just been talking about. And I see there are a couple of questions that say, you know, that let me combine to one asks, what's the evidence of the take up in these thematic, thematic bonds uh, by local versus institutional investors? Are thematic bonds, ESG and line investments you know, actually bringing in foreign institutional investors to emerging corporate bond markets? What's the evidence of that? That's one kind of question. Uh, another kind of related question is when you see things like the financial inclusion initiatives in Kenya through M-Pesa, it's really in stark contrast with other African countries. Can the bank work with those other countries to design similar inclusion mechanisms. So those are kind of crowding in global finance and private capital and taking lessons to other parts of Africa. Indeed, uh, Dean, actually uh, on the first one, uh, let me tell you a story uh, because the World Bank uh, uh, broadened our thematic bond from green bond to SDG bond because we'd like to draw attention to not only green climate issue, but other issue. And I was fascinated, you know, I went to Japan uh, um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to connect with Japanese investors on a, a particular thematic bond called food loss and waste. Yeah? And of course, this is an issue not really in the global headlines, but through our investor outreach, through our awareness campaign, even I was, you know, I was humbled to be educated that food loss and waste is actually the third largest carbon emitter after energy and transport, right? 20% of fresh water resources wasted due to food loss and waste. Now, once you go to investor, and this time we target a Japanese investor, we raised a couple billion dollars. So, so investors care about, you know, issues. And, and of course, food loss and waste a different in developed country and developing country. But there are food loss and waste all over the world. In developed country is, you know, if you eat a small portion, you buy a large portion, you just throw away, right? And in developed country, it may be, there is no cold storage uh, between production and transportation and final destination. Therefore, one third of the vegetables are rotten. So, you know, of course you address, so all of this through the somatic bond, we bring awareness, we bring the work we do, uh, which triggers additional interest. So I'm just using this uh, as a handle, but we have already, you know, we have done blue bond to address ocean pollution, right? Uh, and other issues. So somatic bond uh, is not sort of ring fence, but it, we use somatic bond to bring focus on different SDG challenges, raise awareness, 
and hopefully get the investors more committed. Just like green bond, the growth of green bond. I, I think that's something I, I wanted to say. On the second one, indeed, it puzzles me that why certain entrepreneurship or a certain you know, new ways of doing things thrive in one country, and yet somehow it doesn't work in another country. And, and fundamentally, I think this is also uh, uh, from my experience in IC, is that countries, and this is the role of government, countries should provide an enabling environment so that investors, entrepreneurs feel comfortable and, and to use their creative energy to create enterprises, to create new solutions. Somehow, you know, Bob Collimer, who uh, was the, the CEO of Safaricom, he passed away last year, right? He was instrumental as an individual, but he would not have gone anywhere if if uh, Kenya Central Bank and Kenya Minister of Finance and Kenya Telecom Ministry said, no, this is, this is weird. I don't want to allow you to do this. They were given a sandbox and this sandbox was so powerful, you know, it became a success, right? So what we do as a World Bank and IC, we, we learn what worked, right? And then it be, become policy advices to share with the other countries that, what kind of sandbox, and here we work with countries who have done this, Singapore, South Korea, China, so on and so forth, so that we become a, 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 a source of global best practices, and then use our, our, our you know, financial and advisory capacity, hopefully to accelerate digital uh, um, inclusion agenda. Um, and, and it's fascinating uh, you know, to me. By the way, people probably don't know, Bangladesh, the financial inclusion also made tremendous progress uh, um, uh, through, through an entrepreneur, but also through government uh, enabling financial inclusion because they have given this startup a, a, a license to operate, uh, you know, in addition to what uh, uh, Grameen Bank has done. Well, thank you. Um, we, we just have a couple of minutes left and I do want to give you all, both of you one minute conclusion, but I think we have a cluster of questions that are asking, what is the bank able to do on the question of equitable distribution of vaccines? Um, and, and I do think, you know, part of that 13 billion you have or 12 billion is, is not just on um, purchasing, but also on distribution. I wonder if you just have a comment on, on, on what role the bank can do to help in the equitable distribution of vaccines. Yes, absolutely. So of course, the first is the priority is to the poorest countries that itself would not have the capacity you know, to do. Just to give you an example, the 3 billion we have already uh, 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 dispersed uh, are for 32 countries of which 15 uh, uh, African countries, right? That itself shows the priority that we give. Now, of course, we would only disperse or agree when a country request. And of course, that request itself most likely come from country that itself would not have that capacity. So there is all already a positive discrimination there. That is, this resource goes to the place most needed. Now, within a country, we work with government, of course, to make sure the most vulnerable people, and of course, we work with WHO and others to ensure that the, the list would, would achieve the maximum impact in terms of the vulnerable, the most vulnerable group, the groups that would mitigate you know, uh, uh, contagion, so on and so forth. But it's, there is no one solution because every country faces different challenges and different priorities. But I think at the onset, that goal of equitable uh, distribution, working with COVAX, working with the international community, that is the guiding principle that guides our work. Thank you. Now, I wanna ask you both an impossible question for uh, 30 seconds each to close this out. Trish, 
We've talked about advancing the sustainable development goals in the post-COVID world. What's the main thing that you think the world needs to focus on and our students should in thinking about that question? You've talked about macro. I have exactly. talked about macro and I'm gonna to stick to my comparative advantage here or like macro and finance. Um, uh, can I have two? No, one minute. Um, because I'm, I want to echo what Jing Dong said about multi. Oh, you can have two bye, bye, goals. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna echo what Jing Dong said about multilateralism. I realize I've been the negative Nelly on this uh, in, uh, amongst the two of us, but I'm actually not pessimistic about multilateralism. Maybe I'm overly optimistic because of the change in um, administration in the United States, but uh, being an American. But, uh, but regardless, I will take it. I think the global dialogue, as horrible as the economic situation is, the global dialogue is an order of magnitude better than it's been in five years. So I'm I'm actually optimistic on that. Um, the second is seriously, paying for all of this is going to end up being key. And so the financial markets, the global financial markets angle of this, you absolutely cannot ignore. And it's multifaceted. We've I'm not going to repeat everything we said because we've said a lot in the last hour, um, but that will be absolutely critical. Um, and I think everybody who is in this world should be paying a lot of attention to the, the, the kind of simple, how we're going to pay for it all. Thank you very much. Shintong, you have the final word. Yes. The global annual GDP is around 80 trillion. Global population is about 7 billion. You divide the two, every citizen of the world could have had a middle-class life. And yet the world is so unequal, right? Which means that the world creates enough wealth, has enough financial resources to solve all of the global challenges. Uh, you know, our, our challenge is really to redirect that global savings to addressing those issues, in incorporating ESG, addressing climate, addressing SDG goals, and ultimately, hopefully investors will realize doing well and doing good is one thing through multilateralism. Thank you so much. We have so many questions we weren't able to get to, but I thank you all for uh, submitting those questions. I know we have participants from all over the world. I'm seeing questions from South Asia, from Europe, from the United States. Um, so thank you all participating and a great thanks to our speakers today, Jin Dong Hua and Trish Moser. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for being part of this, what I hope will be ongoing conversation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Wonderful you. Stay well. You